Good afternoon. I'm going to be talking to you today about how you can look at intraspecific variation in order to detect sexual reproduction in Ediacaran organisms. So as we all know, life has existed on Earth for well over three and a half billion years. Uh, but it's only during the Ediacaran time period that we start seeing large complex organisms in the fossil record. Before the Ediacaran, we have microbial life, and after the Ediacaran, we have the Cambrian, which is where we see most modern animal groups first appear. But the Ediacaran is critically important because it's where we see animals in the fossil record for, for the first time. Some of them are quite convincing, like this Bobina here, and this Kimberella up here, which is suggested to be a mollusk. But a lot of them are quite odd. So recent analyses using developmental biology and biomarkers have shown that the Dickinsonia belong to the total group methadone. But as we get a little bit older, we have uh, things like this Heutia, which is suggested to be a cnidarium with possible muscle fibres. And of course, we need to talk about this triangle here, which is uh, called Thectardis and suggested to be a sponge. Yeah. So um, I work on one of the oldest of the Ediacaran groups, which is known as the Avalonia assemblage, which is found in Newfoundland, Canada, um, and in Charmwood Forest here in the UK. Now, the Avalonian assemblage is dominated by rangimals. So these are a clade of what's known as fractally branching organisms. So that's because they've got uh, primary branches that have secondary branches and tertiary branches, and sometimes up to five different orders of branching. So while they look superficially like plants, they're found in very deep water, so we know they couldn't have been photosynthetic. So as a result, these body plans that we're seeing are unique. We don't find them elsewhere in the fossil record or alive today, which means studying them pretty hard. But what we do have is absolutely exceptional preservation. So this is the UNESCO World Heritage Site of Mistaken Point with the E and D surfaces. And on each of these surfaces, we have thousands upon thousands of fossils um, preserved and volcanic ash where they lived. And because they couldn't move around, we have a very, very good idea of what these communities look like. So after the last, uh, over, uh, over the last three years, I've been mapping out all of the Avalonian communities that have more than 100 specimens in, um, in Newfoundland, Canada, in the, in the UK. So with each, uh, these are some of the surfaces I've, I've actually worked up. We've got the grey area is the area mapped. So each dot represents a fossil specimen, different colours, a different species, and the size of the circle represents the height into the water column of these different specimens. And we can see we have a huge variety of different sorts of <coughs> communities. We have uh, what are surfaces like the E surface at Mistaken Point and Bed B in Charmwood Forest, which are very, very diverse. We also have other, other communities, such as H14 in Bristol Cove, which are dominated just by one species. H14, 98% of the specimens on that surface are fractifusus. We also see a very large range of <coughs> body sizes. So Spaniards Bay just has centimetre scale fronds. Whereas Bed B in Charmwood Forest, you have fronds that are almost a metre in length. So I've been focused mostly recently on uh, Fractifusus. So I love studying Fractifusus because you have huge amounts of them. There are three surfaces in Newfoundland that have over 1,500 uh, specimens on. Now Fractifusus lived directly on the seafloor. It couldn't move around. It wasn't up, upright in the water column. But it, it is very, very abundant and very taxonomically well-defined, which me means we can use some really detailed statistical analyses to look at what's going on with it. So a couple of years ago, I looked at, uh, used spatial analysis to try and un understand the dispersal patterns of Fractifusus. And what I found is that you had a primary colonisation where the Fractifusus settled out of the water column. You then had a first generation that were reproducing asexually via stolon, or runners, to produce uh, clones of the original... Uh, parent organism, and then you can have up to another generation of that. And since I, I came out with this study, uh, some colleagues, Alex Liu and Frankie Dunn, have actually found evidence of fractifusus with attached filaments, so look very much like stolon. But it's not just fractifusus that have, has these filament or stolon attached to it. Um, you also have several other, other different species of rangimorphs. The most convincing ones are from the LC6 surface in Bonavista. And here we see various different filaments attached to rangimorphs. So we've got here, we've got a frond, and we've got various filaments coming off. And one of them goes off up here and attaches to another frond. And here is a really, really beautiful set of specimens. So we've got the filament coming down, attaching to the whole plus disc, going to another one, and going, going off again. So we've got really compelling evidence that we actually do have, um, fossil, uh, we have fossil evidence of stolon in the Ediacaran. 
But what's been bugging me ever since this study is how on earth were these propagules formed? So in modern benthic communities, 96% of such propagules are formed by sexual reproduction. But we can't ignore this 4%, especially in the Ediacaran. So the question is, how on earth do you go about trying to work out whether the initial colonisers were the result of sexual reproduction or not? And that's what I'll be talking about now. So there are actually a huge amount of different types of organisms that reproduce both asexually and sexually. And in particular, I'm interested in mo modern benthic communities, such as bryozoans, as is shown in this slide, but also with corals. And the advantage of this is we can do genetic analyses as well as morphological analyses to actually work out what exactly is going on. So here we've got some bryozoan colonies. They're in the intertidal zone, so they're actually not underwater at the moment, but you can, it means you can see them very clearly. And what you have is you have uh, initial colonisers at the centre of each colony that then reproduce asexually. So we've done genetic analyses on, the, on these sorts of bryozoan colon, colonies and also on coral communities to show that you've got these... The, the colonisers are sexually uh, produced, but the, the subsequent kind of clones or colonies that form are asexually produced. And these can then be linked to morphological <coughs> analyses to show that this kind of genetic diversity is also reflected in morphological diversity. So what can we look at with fractifusis? So fractifusis, I considered two different sorts of metrics. Firstly is the length-width ratio. Um, and the second aspect is the number of modules or sets of primary branches that go along here. <coughs> And there's a surprisingly large amount of variation. When you're looking at almost 5,000 specimens, things are a lot more variable than you might suspect. So if you fit this very simple linear models, you can see that you've got, you're only describing about 40% of the variation in these populations uh, uh, just by increasing the length. There's a lot of variation going on. We want to try and describe that. So how are we going to go about that? So if we go back to the spatial analyses, um, you can determine that for around each of the largest specimens, there's a cluster of small ones that's 25 centimetres in diameter. So what that means is that um, you can define this as being the area of the colony from the initial coloniser. <coughs> but you don't want to have overlapping colonies because then you're not sure which offspring correspond to which parent. So we're removing them. We then want to look at uh, how much variation is occurring within each colony. And to do that, I use something called the coefficient of dispersion. So lots of vertebrate paleontologists use something called the coefficient of variation. But this data is not normally distributed, so instead we're <coughs> using the non-parametric -para equivalent. So if it's zero, then you've got no variation. And as the numbers get bigger, you have more variation. So what I then did is then for each of the kind of first generation around the, the initial colonizers, measured the length width ratio and the number of modules. And once I've done that for the entire colony, I then calculated the coefficient of dispersion, um, which becomes a point on the graph. You then repeat this over and over again, <laughs> um, and you build up over time, and once you've got 70 or 100 colonies, depending on the surface, you can produce a box, box plot. So you've got the median, the median is given by the straight line, and then you've got the, the amount of variation which, so this box plot is describing the amount of variation within each of the colonies across the entire surface. You then need to take it across to the initial uh, colonizers as well, the large ones. And what you find is that um, you, you measure up all the length width ratios and all the number of modules, and you can calculate the coefficient of dispersion again. And so what's going on with that? So starting off with the D surface, calculated all the coefficient of dispersions for each of the individual colonies that aren't overlapping with any other colonies. And we can see here we've got a coefficient of dispersion of about 0.2 is the median. If we then look at the variation between all the co uh, communities, what, what we find is actually much larger. It's almost three times larger, and this is sig statistically significantly larger. And we see a similar pattern occurring for E surface. We have a bit more variation um, in the variation of the different colonies, but we have a statistically significantly higher amount of variation between all the different colonies. And the same thing's happening again for the H14 surface. So what this is showing us is that the within colony variation is significantly smaller than the between colony variation for the length width ratios. And we can see similar patterns going on for the, the number of modules. We again have a relatively small amount of variation within each of the colonies, but between, uh, between the colonies we have much more variation. So this enables us to reconstruct the, 
the life, uh, the life cycle of Ractifusus. So you have a spawning event, it's got the, the red and the yellow ones, they release the propagules into, into the plants, which then mix. You produce offspring that are a mixture of the two, uh, well, the, uh, or the, uh, the initial parents. These can then reproduce asexually, producing offspring that look very much like theirs. There's very little um, diversity within each of the colonies. And this, this process can happen multiple times. You can have multiple generations of solaniferous reproduction, and you, you potentially have multiple spawning events as well. So, to conclude, we've shown that uh, variation within a colonies of fractifuses is significantly smaller than between the different colonies. And what this is suggesting is that Rangimorphs were actually reproducing sexually, um, but it also demonstrates that they're actually quite sophisticated. They're capable of synchronising their behaviour, their spawning events. And this is the uh, oldest evidence of eumetozoan sexual reproduction at about 566 million years. It uh, remains for me to thank all my uh, collaborators and all the people who've helped me in the field and, of course, my funding bodies. Thank you very much. Thank you.